So um, O3 front end communicates with the back end uh, using the REST API, Fire or a custom REST. In the past for O2, it wasn't the same. We were using server-side rendering of whatever page you, you see on the O2 interface. It was all server-side rendered. But for O3, we are taking advantage of the modern uh, web development tools and languages, and hence doing all as client-side rendering. So as a result of that, there's a lot of communication between the front end and the back end using REST. That's why it's critical when you're doing um, uh, all three development to get familiar with the REST API because you will not be able to store data or retrieve data from the back end when you do not have this information. So I'm going to share links for the documentation of the REST API and the Fire API. So um, let me talk about Fire. Uh, Fire is an interoperability standard uh, for data exchange between healthcare systems. And op as OpenMRS, we are adopting it. So, and we, our recommendation going forward is whenever a REST API is implemented in OpenMRS, we would rather you take you use that instead of our custom REST API. We, the, our ideal place is we envision ourselves uh, to reach a point where uh, we can have the front end talk to our back end strictly and purely via the Fire API. But unfortunately, we are not yet there. Uh, but we still have a number of resources that are not yet converted to Fire. So for those cases, we find ourselves switching to uh, the custom REST API. But eventually, uh, we plan to have all resources implemented as Fire resources. So I, I would like to share, um, as this command goes, uh, not to waste your time. I would like to share um, a couple of um, resources here for you. Um, the first one that I'm going to share is um, uh, this one. So that's our fire strategy. Um, uh, for those who have not read it before, um, it gives you an explanation of what, why we need to use fire. For those who are hearing fire for the first time, it gives you a couple of links. Uh, where you can explore that, uh, what, why is it used for, uh, when should you use it? You know, it goes and gives links to our fire documentation, our IG and all that stuff. So in your spare time, you can go through this to get an in-depth understanding of why fire and the cases where I use the fire API and for the cases where I use our own REST API, okay? So that's a very good documentation that I recommend you to go through. Okay, and then I would also share another link for our REST API. Uh, I'll share two links. The first one is for our REST, uh, the OpenMRS REST module uh, in general, but in, in particular for today's uh, discussion, I would like us to look at that uh, Web Services REST API for clients, okay? Um, let me check on our... Progress, it's not yet there, but okay, it's almost getting there. Um, as this continues, uh, let me talk a little bit about how to do the uh, the backend calls using uh, either the REST API or the Fire. It's also called a Fire REST API, but when, it, when I talk of REST API, I mean our custom OpenMRS API module, and then when I talk of the other one, I'll say Fire. There are two modes. Uh, you can go to Dev3, uh, dev3. I don't think I need to give you the dev3 link because I think you already know about this link. Uh, so when you log in dev3 and go to the admin screen, under REST Web Services, you'll see it as settings, API documentation, and tests. Okay. Let me start with API documentation. Uh, the API documentation uh, used to be our old Swagger API documentation. Uh, we deprecated it, so we no longer use it, but it can help you to know which resources are available. <clears throat> As you can see, we have uh, the OBS resource, we have the drag resource, uh, server log. You, you, you're not going to use all these resources, but just for you to get an, an idea of what's available, you see that we have a get for the OBS, you know, a post for the OBS, then a get where you pass the OBS and then a UID, uh, quite a number of them. Um, 
you can scroll through them and uh, I want us to concentrate on the patient. You can even search through them. Uh, I can do control F then type patient. Um, so in this case, I wanted us to get the patient resource. Uh, as you can see, uh, we're going to play a little bit of the patient resource, but it gives you the options that are available where you can search for all patients, you know, a particular patient using a UID, a search and ETC. So when you click on any of these, like when I click on a get, it will list for you the parameters, uh, like limiting the number of results to return, you know, the index, the offset from which to start, you know, version and all those things. Um, I'm going to explore a little bit more of this in detail. I just wanted to use this time as we wait for this to, uh -huh, okay. So getting back to this, so it has successfully built the front end assets. Now it's asking me, what port would you like your server to use? Um, it gives you a default. In this case, it's port 80080. If you're not having any process running on this port, the default should be fine. But just in case you have something else that's running on this port, you are free to type any other port like 889 or whatever it is. But in this case, I don't have anything running on port 8080, so I'm just going to go with this. Uh, if you want to go with whatever it specifies as a, as a default, you only press enter and that's it. So then it's, it asks you, would you want to enable remote debugging uh, and then etc, etc. My recommendation is uh, for now, just go with the default, which is no debugging by simply pressing enter. Later on, when you get advanced in the use of your SDK, you will enable this and configure the port and all that stuff. But for now, first time setup, don't worry about this. Just go with the default and say, press enter, which means no debugging. And then <coughs> it asks for which database to use. <coughs> Currently, we support MySQL, MariaDB, and Postgres. <coughs> uh, for MySQL, it should be 5.7 and above. I think we should uh, <coughs> update the SDK to indicate that it's 5.7 and above. But don't worry about the labels. Uh, as long as you know, so if if you have a MySQL uh, installed somewhere, or if you have MySQL running as a Docker container, that is option number two. Uh, you know, so this two and three require Docker, but for one and four, you don't. So if you have Postgres installed in your machine, you can go with option number four, as long as Postgres 8.2 and above. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to go with the very first option, which is MySQL 5.7 and above. Uh, in this case, I have MySQL 8 installed on my machine. Uh, so it fits in option number one because anything that is from 5.7 and above is a valid option for number one. So in this case, switch on you choose. I type one and then press enter. And then, so it says, this distribution requires a MySQL database. Please specify the database URL. Uh, my recommendation is do not touch this URL because I've found many uh, posts on talk for help when using the SDK and they are to do with touching this URL, trying to type stuff with it. Uh, it. When you are an expert using the SDK, it's fine. You can customize this URL, but when you are a newbie using the SDK for the first time, the easiest option is just leave it as it is. The defaults are usually good and they work most of the time. So in this case, it provides us a default URL with a default MySQL port and uh, DB name uh, as a placeholder, but it's going to replace this with the name of the SDK server that you chose. In this case, we chose server 13. So I'm just going to press enter to say that I, I wanna just go with the default, okay? Then it asks you to, for the database uh, username. Uh, that should be a, an account that has create database privileges. It gives you the default as root, but in case you have any other account that you would want to use uh, for accessing the database, you can type the name of that account. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm just going to go with the default as it suggests, which is root. So in this case, I'll just press enter. But in case you don't want to use the root account and you want to use a different account and that account has create database privileges, feel free to type it in here. But I'll just go with the default and press enter. So please specify the database password. In this case, uh, it's the, a password that corresponds with the, with the name that you specified before. In this case, this is my root account for MySQL. Uh, and I'll just type the uh, password. Okay, so if the password is correct, it will proceed to the next um, 
uh, step. <clears throat> it gives some details about uh, which version of the JDK to choose to use. If you have a wrong password, it will give you an error right away and it will abort. Uh, and the error message will state exactly that it's failed to connect because of the password and all that stuff. But in this case, the password was, was correct, so it succeeded. Uh, if you have multiple versions of Java installed among the supported ones, it will enumerate them here for you. Uh, but in this case, uh, like I said, we require a minimum of Java 8. Java 11 is also supported. So if you want to use Java 11, so you choose this other option of two other, and then it will give you an option for specifying it. But for a newcomer, just go with the first option, which is Java 8, that is listed on number one. Uh, so I type one, press enter, and then it says it has successfully set up. So my server three has been set up successfully. So uh, it gives me a path on my file system where this server is stored. Uh, this server location is helpful when you want to get rid of your servers. For example, if I want to reset and get rid of all my servers and go back to server one or server whatever, this is the folder where it keeps these servers. That's the folder where it searches to see the default name it suggests. If you type a custom name, it will all be stored in this folder. So, so you know this is the folder where the server information is set up. Now, after that has been set up, the, the next step is to run. Uh, following our instructions here, we've been running this setup command uh, and we are done with it. So now we go with the run command. There are a few other options here uh, that follow along with the setup, but I'll not go into those details uh, to make it simple for the start, but I can come back and suck circle back with this, the actual version, you know, ignore dependence and all that stuff. But for now, uh, I, I'll not go into that. This was just a listing of what we are going through, server name etc etc. And then, yeah. So we are to this point where you do the run. After the setup has succeeded, the next step is to actually run that server which we've just set up. So you do run. So when you do this run, uh, it downloads uh, a number of artifacts. Um, and then it's ready. Uh, because I've not provided the, an, the option for which server to run, uh, it lists them for me. Uh, if you don't want it to list them for you, you can use, there's a syntax for minus D and then you put the server ID. Um, you would have provided the other side, but I didn't do that. So for a new comma with the SDK, this is the easiest option because you just press enter, you don't, do anything just in case you don't even know the parameter for specifying which server. Just press enter and it'll list for you. And then you choose which one by using the number against the server. In this case, the one we've just set up is server 13. And according to the numbering system here, it's number one. So I type one. So it's checking if port 8080 is in use, then it says it's free. If it were in use, it would uh, look for you another port. So this runs a number of things behind the scenes. It starts Tomcat, and then once you see, uh, you look a little bit here for it to get, wait for it to get set up. And after it has, so it says here, OpenMRS is ready for use at this, okay? So when you look at this in the logs, that means it's ready for you to go to the browser and access this. So you can just copy this, or you can just type it directly if you know it. But if you're a newcomer, you can just copy this, so you don't have to cram it. And then go to the browser, uh, type it in there and press enter. So, and then here you can see it starts the setup of the backend, okay? So this takes a while. Um, uh, as you can see here from the logs, uh, there's, there's going to be lots of activity uh, for it to set up. So for the setup process, it's, it's a bit slow, so it takes a while. So because it's going to do that, uh, I'll let it go and do that and let us continue with, uh, with the API because there's no input here, it will run. After a couple of minutes, it will complete and then it will set up and then we are ready to log in. But because it will take a while, let us go with the API usage. Um, so I was sharing the links here for the REST API for clients and then for the Fire API. Um, and then I also shared, uh, uh, I think, let me go back to Dev3, sorry. Um, Dev3. Um, I'm going to Dev3, the online version, but after this SDK is set up local in my machine, you can also go to the local version. 
when you go to Dev3, it has API documentation, which I talked about, um, just for you to look at the resources that are available um, uh, and, and see what, what uh, that's for the custom API. But then I'll now go to test. Test, uh, I'll explain that, the Fire and REST API. Uh, Chris uh, is asking what's the difference between the two uh, REST API. There's the Fire one and the, and the our custom uh, API. There's a link that I've shared that I shared, uh, Chris, but let me just share it again here. Chris, that link that I've just shared, it, sh it shows our fire strategy. It will, uh, it, it gives some, a bit of, uh, because of I'm running out of time, I'll not go into those details, but that link will give you a little bit more details of why fire, why we recommend using the fire API, why should you try out fire before uh, going with our custom REST API, okay? And uh, of particular interest, following along that, we have our documentation for the resources that we provide for fire. Uh, when you go to, sorry, uh, when you go to, uh, let me just share it here, <clears throat> fire.openmrs.org, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is trying to, so when you go to that link, uh, it, it, it shows you, you can as well just get that from here, uh, it shows you the resources that we support, uh, in fire, as you can clearly see, there's lots more resources that O3 uses other than just these. But this is a oh dev three link. Okay, sorry. Let me. So that's a dev three link. Okay. So um, <clears throat> um, as I was, as I was saying, there's, there's, there's lots more resources. Uh, if you go to that fire, that open org. Okay, just go to this. When you look at these resources, there's quite lots more resources. Like we have the patient resource and, and the attributes, uh, personal resource, practitioner, all those things. But we use quite more for, for all three. So if you want to make a call to fetch some data uh, at the back end, the first place to go would be to try this fire.openmrs.org and see if the resource you're interested in is among these available ones. And then you start using that. If if you do not find it among these available ones, then that's when you say, okay, it's not available via fire. Uh, then let me go with the OpenMRS REST API. That's the custom REST API. Um, so this... Uh, <clears throat> If you want to, if you if you locate a resource and say the patient resource, and you want to do something with patients, and then you find it here, uh, there's a number of you know how to use the Fire Two API, the Fire API. Uh, there's a very good documentation, a very versatile documentation for how to do the searching. You can also get it still uh, in our Fire Strategy link here, um, but I'll just uh, put it here separately. Um, okay. Uh, okay, let me just uh, go to this. Uh, using the Fire API for the first time uh, requires knowing the syntax on how to do this and that. Uh, but the beauty is that as long as you have the time, the documentation is properly in place. So this uh, gives you, we do not imp implement all the search options available here for Fire, but a, some good number of them are already supported in OpenMRS, but this would be a good place for you to read about how to use the Fire uh, API in OpenMRS. So once a resource is not listed in there, that's when you go to our OpenMRS REST API. Now, <clears throat> when I go back to Dev3 um, uh, and I go to test, so test is uh, a place uh, for you to lightly test our REST API, okay? So it loads something like this. Uh, let me see how far our installation is. It's, it's not yet done, so let's continue with this. Uh, so it supports get, post, put, delete, you know, and then it gives an option for the body content, representation, and all that stuff, okay? Uh, so let's try and test something as simple as, um, say you want to get concepts, 
um, uh, you can see starting from patient, patient is the resource. And then this is the UUID of the patient we want to load. So this resource that loads by default when you load this page is the our REST API for loading a patient with this UUID. But because this is hard coded in the in the test page, you don't have a patient with this UUID. But if you've got a patient on your machine that has this UUID, it will load that patient up. So if I try to do send with this, it says object not found, which means that there's no patient with this UUID. Okay. Uh, if we find if you try to look for a patient, let me try to see if I can get any patient here and get the UID and show you a sample. Uh, let me try to look for, okay. Let me load a patient here and just get their UUID. Uh, that's on dev three. Let me see how far it's still running. Okay, so this is a patient uh, on dev three. Let me just try to pretend as if I'm editing just for the sake of getting the UUID. Uh, there is a patient ID, but it's different from a UUID right here at the bottom. This is the UUID for this patient. Copy, okay. So if I go back to the admin screen, and then uh, go to test. Okay, so I replace this UID with the UUID of a patient that actually already exists. It's a get, so I don't need a body content. So I clear that and click send. Okay, so you can see it returns this for me. Um, it returns details about this patient. Okay, so this is an example of using REST API. Uh, it gets this patient for me and lots of properties here, okay? Uh, I want us to get into a little bit of details on, on how to actually use this. Uh, from yesterday's presentation, I asked, I saw people asking this custom representation, what's it about, you know, how do we create it and all that stuff. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit about it, but I'm going to start by sharing with you the documentation for that. Uh, if you look at, uh, let me just put it, I think, in the chat. REST API for clients. Okay, this is it. I think I shared it already, but let me just share it again here. When you look at REST API for clients, um, it has this documentation about our REST API, um, how to do, you know, what are sub resources. For now, you can skip sub resources. When you're a newcomer, sub resources can be confusing, uh, but I want you to just, uh, slightly go through the URI conventions on how to do, we do our get, our post, you can see they all start with WS, REST, V1, resource, then the queue for the query and all that stuff, for deleting, for, you know, yeah, all that stuff. Uh, we can, we shall get back to that later, but I wanted us to jump to things like the limit. Okay, uh, representation. I'm going to get back to the limit again, but let me first go to the representation representations, this one, because I had people ask about them yesterday. Uh, when uh, Vinit was typing stuff like custom etc etc, right? Okay, so when you go back to this, uh, this is the default representation, as in when you click this and then it comes as it is, it's a default. But when you're consuming this API, sometimes you'll come across scenarios where you don't need all this stuff. As you well, as you're aware, the more data you transfer across the network, you know, the more, you know, data you'll use on your network, the slower it will take for the interface to load, and the, the more uh, stress you'll put at the back end. So trying to limit the amount of data you return is one of the things you should take care of as a good web developer. So say you want to get that about this patient, but you're not interested in all these details that you can see here, right? Say you just want to get the UU, okay, of course you have the UID, but let's assume you only want to get the UID and the display. These two first properties, UID and display, and you don't want anything else, okay? So the custom feature is the one that now comes into play by letting you specify which properties you're interested in. So in this case, I would type custom. The syntax is, Custom, uh, full colon, then the opening bracket and closing. And then within, you put the properties you're interested in. In this case, I want the UUID, comma, display. Only those two. And then I send. 
So you can see that now it returns for me only the UUID and the display and nothing else. Okay. So in that way, I've limited the amount of data that the back end returns me for the same REST API call by simply specifying this as the custom representation. Uh, because I'm doing this via this interface, let me show you how the syntax would uh, it would look like on a, on, a, on a client. Like, I don't know how many of you have used Postman, but Postman is also another client. Uh, there could be multiple that you can use for these REST calls, okay? Um, right here, I can get this exact um, API that I've just done. Um, and then get here, it's on dev3. Um, okay. Okay, right here. Not found. Dev3 patient, okay, let me see. Uh, I think I have, uh, let me copy it again. Okay. Just copying it again properly. So this is Dev3. Uh, let me see where it starts. Open MRS. Okay. Okay. So I don't need this. Not found. Okay. Let me just do patient without this yeah. i'm wondering why this is not getting in but let me just i'll look into that later on let me just um get to this uh, back to our custom representations um i can remove this custom representation and then uh, control A, I'm just delete this one. I send this and it gets me this. Uh, let me share with you something else uh, for this. Um, I want to do something a little bit more complicated. Ah, slash open MRS is missing. Okay, let me try that again. Okay. Okay. I already see it. I think I just put double. Okay. I see. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll look into that later. So um, I want to do another more complicated custom representation. Um, I, I started with a simple one of UUID and then display. Uh, I want to instead have a, a display and parcel. And then I show you something here. Custom um, UUID and then comma, person, okay. Um, okay, did I type it correctly? Let me first do, ah, could it be that the server's gone down? Oh, sorry, I, I forgot to put uh, a full colon, okay. UID, person, okay, thanks. Okay, so as you can see here, I have UID and person, okay? Now, sometimes you may want to drill down into the person object. And maybe in the person, you don't need all these things that have been put under person. And probably you want say uh, the display uh, and the gender or display and the age or just the age, okay? So the syntax is you would come to person here 
and use the same syntax by again using a full colon and then the closing, opening and closing bracket. And then in here, you put, say in this case, I want the display, comma, and then the H. Uh, okay, let me say also gender, gender, comma, and then H. So you see that uh, it has a UUID, uh, it has a person, and from the person, I do the display, gender, and age. You can continue drilling down even further. Um, like, let me say, if I didn't customize this to this, and I say, for the person, I want it to return all those fields. Uh, but let, let me see if there's an object in here. Uh, say attributes, okay? You can go as far as nest it and say, uh, okay, uh, among the persons, I want to go to the preferred name. And then in the preferred name, I want to go to the details of a preferred name. So you can use the same syntax and go deep down in the levels uh, of whatever properties are available for that object. So that's the custom representation that Vinit uh, shared with us. And you can get uh, a little bit more details on here. If you look at this, it gives you some bit of details, some explanations uh, about when you use the, when to use the default. The default is the one that comes up when you don't specify anything, but the full is the one that returns to you everything, okay? So when I go back to um, this call and clear this, replace it with full, this gets me the full object with all the properties as they exist on the server. As you can see, this is lots of data. If there are cases when you need this, you can use this full. But if you don't need all that, that can be uh, a good uh, help for you. Okay. I also want to mention that we have uh, documentation for this uh, REST API. Uh, I think I didn't share that. Let me share that because it's key. Uh, let me put it in the chat here. Um, so this documentation uh, gives you the resources. The unfortunate bit is that this is manual in that uh, when we do resources, new resources, this has to be manually updated. It's not automated, but it's a good starting point for you to see which resources are available uh, with some explanations and uh, bits of information, as you can see here for the patient. Uh, it, it lists for you how we search for a patient, as you can see here, uh, how we get a patient by the UUID. I think we've already done this, uh, whereby we put a patient and the, this, is this is exactly what we did. This is the patient and then the UUID. So that's what is being talked of here. We have a patient and then the target UUID, uh, how to create a patient. <clears throat> so this uh, shows you an example of a post that you would uh, make to this endpoint, and then the data in that post and how you'd actually do a post to create a patient. I, I also want to say that this documentation does not fully exhaust the options, especially when it comes to examples. Uh, very many times I've found people who are have come across and say, yes, I've seen it, but it doesn't give an example of how to do this and that. Uh, the tests in the source code are also good examples of how to use the API, especially for tests that are using JSON directly. I shared a link. I want to share a link with you here. When you go to the OpenMRS REST API uh, on, on GitHub, Web Services REST, uh, this is the REST API module uh, that we use. Uh, for the Fire 2 module, uh, if you go to GitHub and search for Fire 2, you'll also see uh, this is the Fire 2 module. When you go to the tests in these modules, they'll give you good examples of how the module is, is used. Uh, so for those cases where by the, the documentation does not have all that you need, you can go to the test. Let me give you a good example here. Uh, when you go to the REST API module, there is this test which is called patient controller test. Okay. It has some number of tests like should get a patient by UID. It's not a good one because uh, it's, it, it creates Java objects. But I want to give you an example of one which is uses JSON. Should create a patient. So this is a good example for a front end developer because it's doing ex dealing exactly with JSON. So you can see it, 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 it posts JSON, which has a person and the person UID here, then the identifiers and then the location. So if you're trying to use a REST API and you don't know examples of how the data should look like, 
looking at the code for the test resources folder, it will be a good place for you to look at and actually figure out how stuff is used. It's an example of where you're creating a patient, uh, a person and a patient, because this was creating a patient from an existing person. This is creating both a person and a patient from scratch. And then you can see it gives you a sample JSON. Forget about the formatting slashes, uh, but just look at the properties and you know the objects as you would format them in Java script. And then, so this is another good place that I would recommend you to look at when you're dealing uh, with these uh, REST API resources. Let's check on our server to see how fight has gone. I think it should be there. Let me see. Okay, I think this is it. Okay. Uh, I think it has finished. Yes, this is the server that we set up. So I'm going to put SPA uh, home. Okay, so this requires me to select uh, a location and there we go. So this is the uh, new O3 backend that I have set up locally on my machine right here, okay? So as you can see here, you can do lots of things. So uh, you can now start exploring, do the API stuff and all that stuff. If you want to go to the equivalent screen that I've been playing with, you would do the admin slash index.htm. Uh, and then when you get there, you go to test and then start playing with um, this interface for the REST APIs. But if you want to go back to the other uh, O3 home, this is where you would go. So this is the SDK setup of O3, and uh, you can always go back here and then stop the server by Control C in this on this case on my machine. As you can see here, when you stop it and then try to load this, uh, it will not load anymore, but you can always go back and run it again by using the Prometheus SDK run. Um, it prompts you for which server you're choosing. Um, and in this case, I'll choose server one, uh, which is server 13 and it runs. This time it will not take as long as it took for the other time. And once it's done, then you should be able to access the interface and start doing your uh, development using a local O3 server instead of the online Dev3. Um, does the REST API support such other new ID? Yes, it supports lots of uh, options for searching, you know, lots of parameters like limiting and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, unfortunately I've run out of time, but I wanted to, it, but if you look at the documentation that I put for you for the API, you will see it has lots of options, limiting the options, paging the results in case you have a thousand results. How do you reduce them to five at a time, go on for the next one, ETC. So it has plenty of options other than just searching by UID. You can search patients by name, concepts by name, and lots of other parameters. Yeah, you can, can you search, you can search for, yeah, you can search for patients, yeah, right. Though it's recommended to filter them, not to bog down the server. Uh, 